you wouldn't drive faster if you're planning on running it because you're eating at any point when you drive. Und du weißt Bescheid, was wir jetzt anfangen. Läuft noch, oder wie? Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the indoor climbing hub. Welcome to the people joining us online. Welcome everybody in the audience. Welcome our esteemed guests. My name is Liam Lonsdale. In this afternoon, we're doing a world first. We are hosting a panel discussion on route setting. The topic is route setting in gyms. Art. Or customer service. We're going to be discussing whether or not we think it is art or customer service, what the priority should be, and individual perspectives on it. If you are watching online, then you can get involved in the panel talk. Post your questions in the comments section, which is here. Post your questions there. They'll read them out to me, and I'll ask them to them. Similarly, for all you lovely folks here, if you have a question, please do ask it, and we will put it to our panelists. Speaking of panelists, Meine. let's introduce them. So we'll start on the end there, Peter Seidelhack. Peter, welcome. Uh, we also have Kathleen Lehman. We also have, uh, I nearly said Jackie, instead of Jackie. I spoke full German. Jackie Heftle. We also have Nikki Wiechmann and we have Katja Widmer. Um, all very exciting people and I'm going to start at that end and ask them to introduce themselves to you and also to you. So, Peter. Hi, my name is Peter. Like uh, Liam already said, I'm a root setter and I've been setting commercially for 15 years. I've been an operations manager of uh, four gyms here in the Munich area where we act and I now oversee root setting operations as part of the management. Great. Kelly. Hello, and I'm uh, Kadi Lehmann. I live in Freiburg, also in Germany, and I mainly set competitions. I've been doing that for about 10 years, and also I do some commercial route setting, mainly locally in Freiburg for some fun competitions, or also just just daily daily business, basically. Jackie. Uh, my name's Jackie Hefley. I'm from Boulder, Colorado. I've been setting for about 21 years, done a lot of competition and commercial setting. Um, I'm one of the owners of Kilter Grips also, so mostly now I set comps and do Kilter stuff. I just don't have time to set commercially right now, most of the time. I do like uh, another thing called the Route Setting Institute, and we do do commercial sets and resets also. So I do all this stuff. And Nikki. Uh, I'm Niklas. Uh, I'm setting since I'm 15. I'm a freelance setter, and uh, mostly I teach people how to set nowadays. Um, I used to have... Uh, my own gym. I was founder of Stuntwork and after uh, I left Stuntwork I traveled more around the world so I spent the last one and a half years in Australia setting down under. I also spent some time in England and uh, yeah. 
You also have your own YouTube channel as well. I have my own. Yeah, Beta Root Setting. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, we are doing World Cup reports and anal anal reports about the uh, World Cup finals. And uh, we will also do this for lead. I'm pretty much into, yeah, like nerding about climbing. I love this. Uh. Uh, hi, I'm Katya from Slovenia. Uh, I've been climbing for many, many years. Then competing, rock climbing, setting, coaching. So all my life just climbing. <laughs> <laughs> um, lately, uh, for one year, I've been setting internationally. So I have some pretty, I'm lucky enough to have some pretty cool experience from that. And yeah, setting is just um, one of my passions. And uh, other than that, I work with 360 holds. Great. So as you can probably gather, we have a high pedigree of panelists. Uh, I'm going to start again with you. What is your opinion? Should root setting be art, or should root setting be focused on customer service? Basically, depends on where you're setting. If you're setting for a IFSC World Cup, uh, it would be more art, functional art, than uh, a service. But if you're setting commercially, like for the gyms that we cater, um, it's more a service with art aspect, but not, not leveled out to, to the extent that what Katja said sets. Mm -hmm. Kari? Um, for me, it's definitely both, because um, every boulder is, to me, just an art. And also, you, you see it. It should look beautiful, too, and it should be nice, it should be a nice uh, service for a customer, which in that case can be a competitor as well. It's also like a customer to me. Mm -hmm. Jackie? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, I think that part of our job as setters is to create a learning experience for our customers and help them progress. And so there's an art to doing that well. Ultimately, you are creating a product, but I think it's very important to not disregard the artistic side of the product. You just can't let the artistic side overcome the usefulness. So you need to make sure that you have a, a good product as well. And that's one of the things that takes a long time, I think, with setting to balance out. Interesting. Uh, I don't Niklas. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's uh, that much of an art. I think it's more like design, practical design, customer design, uh, user design, because we are designing something with a purpose. And art doesn't have a purpose. There are no rules to it. So you, art would be, we put a volume on the wall, and we are like, go. Have fun with it. But uh, when I do my job, I want to create like a customer journey, a customer experience. So for me, it's really like more or less design. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I would say like for, for me uh, as a setter, it's, I have a certain aesthetic. And um, I think it's important to have a vision and what you want to achieve. But at some point, you need to step back and say, OK, this is, this is not a place where I can just express myself. I'm here for a purpose. This, we have a goal. We need to uh, have a happy customer, or we need to have a good competition. And yeah, so just to consider also this. But I think, yeah, it's a combination of many things. So. Uh, what I should have said is, if you do have an opinion or a question in the audience, throw up a hand, give me a wave. I can only look so many ways, but we definitely want you guys to get involved. And the same goes for you guys at home. If you have an opinion, art or design, what should root setting be for you, then drop it in the comments. I have a man over there that will ask those questions to us. Uh, would it be fair to say everybody here climbs indoors on a fairly regular basis? Yes? Hands up? <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. But you climbed indoors. <laughs> and yeah, OK. Um, for me, I, I can really, I'm really glad you said the word aesthetic, because I can really pinpoint some of my best indoor climbing experiences on the aesthetic of a boulder. You know, I will walk into a gym. A good example would be Efir in Nuremberg. And they have this crazy block right as soon as you walk through the door. And that's like their exhibition wall. They always do something interesting and it's the first block that I get on every time and they're generally brilliant blocks there's hundreds of boulders in that gym that are amazing but this really aesthetic set one is the one that draws me to it what's your opinion on that 
uh, yeah, for sure, it's first thing um, is, okay, I want to climb this. So is it competitor anyway has different motivation, but still I think it um, translates into more than just I need to get to top if it's a nice line that looks uh, good and also aesthetic is also how it climbs, not just the first look. So yeah. how it flows and everything, and then it's some special moments. Hopefully, come <laughs> out. <laughs> uh, I think it's pretty risky, or like it's. I, I know what you're talking about. Like we are drawn to uh, visual, like beautiful-looking creations. Like whether it's a boulder, a good-looking house, uh, a nice computer looking better than the other ones, you, you, it, it attracts your attention. But I think it's also like it's an easy way to set bowlers like this, but it's also like pretty risky and pretty lame at some point, in my opinion. Take a look, uh, we take some lapis balls and we, all we do is like ball, 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 ball. So we follow the, like just the symmetry. So it looks amazing, but it climbs really, really boring after a certain amount of time, in my opinion. And I think you always have to watch out that the function, so the, uh, the climb itself, uh, is the main thing you should worry about and then after this you juice it up so you make it sparkling and you make the climbing experience also look good so I think yeah that's uh, my take on this <laughs> yeah can I, I have something on this too Please. I, mean, I, I usually consider it like I, I think that people are really concerned with the aesthetic now which is great because it didn't used to be that way and I think the aesthetic is important because it draws people in and if you set like a climb like Nikki has described and it was an easier climb, it would be a really popular problem in the gym because it would be, it would look attractive and it would be really manageable for, the, for people to climb. So it would get climbed a lot. And there's some amount of the gym that should have that. But I think it's really important to make sure that it does function, like they're saying. And so setters are kind of have gone too far, I think, towards the idea of the aesthetic and they get too indulgent with what they want it to look like. And they don't rein themselves in and bring it back to what's important in the climb. So like we've seen that in and it's very hard to set high-end competitions, but you, you can find examples in high-end competitions in the last few years where the setters were too indulgent for what they wanted it to look like, and they were not paying enough attention to how it was going to function. And you can see that because problems happen in the competition. People skip holds. Um, the climb doesn't function very well for the comp. And you can actually, tie, I think you could tie that back in some cases. You could say, look, they were obviously really focused on the aesthetic here, and they didn't focus enough on the function, and it had a problem. Um, so it's really important, I think, to continue to pay attention to what the function is. And it may be that if it's a really like, easy boulder, like an intro-level boulder, the function may be just look attractive and make people want to try it. And as long as it's not like, going to hurt them and it's you know, kind of fun, it can be a great boulder for, for a commercial gym. So you just have to make sure that you're always kind of looking at it objectively and trying to find that center point that really kind of merges it looking good or being attractive and also functioning super well. Interesting. Any thoughts on that? Or are we saying the same thing? Well, I think the first impression definitely counts, but uh, the function shouldn't disappear. It's more value to me. Like, yeah. So one thing that you just touched on very briefly, talking about easy boulders. Um, I know many head setters, gym managers, that will rate the quality of a freelance setter by the quality of their easy boulders. And certainly as someone that travels around and goes to a lot a lot of gyms, you know, in the hundreds internationally, I often can tell whether or not I'm going to have a good session at the gym by the quality of the easy boulders that I do in my warm-up. Where does the compromise come there in aesthetic? Because, you know, how easy is it or how hard is it to set V0, V1, V2 and make it look as good as something that you see in a competition? It's basically easy. As a, as a setter, you wouldn't be a beginner climber, so... Um you would obviously be strong, and um, it's an, an empathic, empath empathic thing to setting, or the aspect of uh, having empathy for someone else and uh, trying to see what they need, trying to, to feel how they feel when they climb the easy climb, the V0s, the entrance level ones, the like your entry ticket to the gym, you don't want to spoil your first time customer by like, ah, easy climbs, I don't care about them. He's obviously not going to come back because he doesn't have a nice experience the first time he pops into the gym. And if you make it nice and easy and flowy for them to, to have a great experience when they climb, they can't verbalize, I've been missing a foot. They can't verbalize, that was a long move. They just can sum up their experience when they first come into the gym. Did I have fun or not? It's a, it was a somewhat leading question, but 
one experience that I really remember very well was going to Stuntwerk a few years ago, many years ago now actually, and going in there and doing easy boulders and doing these kind of acro style boulders before they were at every gym everywhere and Stuntwerk was known for it and just thinking, whoa, like I'm climbing 6A and this boulder looks World Cup. like a World Cup boulder, <laughs> but it feels easy, but it feels difficult, but it feels amazing. And every boulder that I did, you know, had that, it had the aesthetic, it had the feeling. And no matter what grade you were climbing, you could kind of have that same experience. And that was like a defining moment, certainly an easy setting for me. Uh, you need a lot of volumes. You need a big wall, big gym, and a lot of volumes. And that's something I think uh, more and more gyms pay attention to, but not enough right now. Um, if I take a look, uh, I just know pictures, but there are like new gyms opening uh, in the United States, and they have like these huge, beautiful buildings, beautiful walls, but there's not a single plywood volume, uh, which uh, annoys me a little bit and also irritates me because if I create this experience for a climber, for a beginner, how do I do that? I try to create an experience which doesn't require any power, so they don't need to be like physically advanced. I try to create something balancey, so you go onto something, over something, around something. This is really rewarding. It's also easy to approach, so you can try it all over and over and over again. And it also looks good. And it also makes it less length dependent because you have this big surface where all sizes can step on, reach onto. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> stunt work, yeah. That's what we did in stunt work. Like, uh, yeah, um, I ordered uh, more volumes than I thought, and then I had these volumes. And uh, I think it's really important like, to pay the same amount of uh, love you put into hard bowlers, also in your easy bowlers. Because for me, even like the uh, beginner climbers, they, uh, they appreciate it even more. Yeah, uh. I agree. And I think one of the problems, especially in the US with these new gyms, is there's a the, the industry's changed a lot in terms of budgeting for climbing holds. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody thinks climbing holds are too expensive, volumes are too expensive. You're spending millions of dollars opening this building, and they want to spend 60,000 euro or something on holds. It's not enough. It needs to be 250,000 euro or more for holds of volumes. Minimum. So pe people need to be budgeting differently for these big projects because they think they want it to look like stunt work. They want it to look like the new Earth Treks Inglewood in Denver, but they don't want to spend the money. They think I want to spend five to seven dollars per square foot for my holds. That's a number that I heard from a wall company. That's not accurate anymore. You can do that, but you have blobs all over your wall. If you want like a big tufa system like 360 makes or like kilter makes, or you want big volumes like wood volumes or fiberglass volumes, you have to plan the money to do that to create that experience. Um, and for the low end climbers as well, like it used to be if you got cool holds, you used them on your hard climbs. Most of the people in your gym don't climb harder than V6. Probably like, I don't know, 60 to 80% of your gym will never climb hard. Or, like, they might climb harder than V6, but they generally don't. Or they're going to warm up on those grades. So those are the grades you're getting the most attention. They need to have climbs that have good, expensive, nice holds for those climbers, because everybody likes new holds. I mean, the very first climber that comes in the gym, like their very first time, they may not know one hold from another, but they'll know, like, that's big. I want to grab it or try to stand on it. So we have to serve all of those people, and part of that's budgeting and planning. Have we got any questions out here or observations or thoughts? What about on the, on the internet? Nearly said on the line. <laughs> on the line. <laughs> what on year line. is it? I don't know. They want to buy all the holes. Have we lost him? All the volume. Is our man gone? Yeah. Christian, any questions coming in? No. Get him in. Hey, what are you doing? Put your coffee down. Start typing. It's probably a bit late for coffee. Beer. Um, Peter, what do you think about that? The easy, the easy question. Like, like I already said, is the setter side to it, the approach, the amount of love that you put into the, the easy climbs? Because obviously, as a setter, you would have a, a tendency to, to set at your limit to, to make training climbs, like it was for, for some time. A group of setters would be setting the climbs to cater their needs, to get stronger, to train on their weaknesses. But it's not about us. It's about the the guys or the girls coming into the gym and wanting to have a good time. They're paying money for it. They're spending their free time. So it's, it's basically not about the setters. The setters, if they enjoy what they're doing, uh, my take is that it's obviously a nicer product to, as, a, as a bottom line, but it's, it's all about the, the ones that have to climb it, be it a World Cup climber, form follows function, 
but uh, same time in a commercial context, uh, the easy climbs need to be as appealing as the hard climbs. You need to pay respect to all of all of the groups that you have into into your gym or on your wall or in your competition. It's the same all over again. Certainly, one thing that I've noticed, and I'm so glad that we've got both of you here for 360 and for Kilter, is that hold manufacturing now is so much more aesthetic than it's ever been. You know, certainly, I remember when the uh, the big spheres appeared at the World Cup, those big dual texture half domes on the wall, mind blowing. I remember when the kilter grip showed up for the BD project in uh, Clatter Center in Stockholm. You know, all of us were just stood there like, what the are those? You know, we were blown away. How much does the aesthetic of the hold, how much of a part does the aesthetic of the hold play in, you know, the way that you build a boulder? Mm. For me, uh, I like to get inspiration from holds, so normally I don't plan so much what I'm going to set. I, okay, I check. Okay, I want to take this, so just to have inspiration and good feeling when, uh, before I start. And then, yeah, it's just a process of uh, thinking about 1,000 things. You want to yeah. make it look good, you want to make it just perfect, you want this move, you want this, take care about size. Oh, what is my neighbor doing? Oh, same color. Okay, change. So it's <laughs> just trying to <laughs> get everything together <laughs> in a good combination. Um, and yeah, I want to uh, hold sir for sure something you inspire. You get um, also idea for the moves and what you want to set. So you would say you set hold first rather than move first? Uh, it depends. I'm not sure if this works. Uh, if we have a plan, okay, I need to set this, mm -hmm. then I, of course, uh, I check the profile of the wall and then choose according to this, but I just like to have like a moment of inspiration and take it from there. What about you, Caddy? Are you a hold first or a move first person? That depends, as Katja yeah. just said, but uh, if you said commercially, I really like to get inspired by climbing holes and I walk into the grip room first and then look and ah, I don't know these or I like these and then I choose a profile where it could fit. But if there's a plan like in a competition and you should set a compression boulder or something, then you need to be a bit more choosy with holes. But still, I get inspired by the holes, but I'm choosy a bit. So it depends. Nikki? Move first. I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, I had a phase, I have to admit, like that was like when I was setting a lot in Munich at Boulder World and I liked this style. Like Dave was like the first setter for me who pushed like a design, artsy looking style, symmetry. But at some point it just hit me like, so like yeah, you take three volumes here, triangle shaped, three here and it lo uh, one more, it looks, like a, it looks like a Christmas tree. So you can climb it, but is it good? Like at some point I was like, okay, that's not good anymore. Or not, it doesn't, doesn't make it for me. So nowadays I try to take a look what I have and uh, wall holds volumes and then I try to come up with a, with a move I want to set. It also makes it easier, I learned this like working in a team because you have stuff to discuss about. Is it, if it's just good looking but it doesn't climb well, it's really hard to criticize for me like to say like, oh, the boulder doesn't climb that well. But if someone has a move in mind and the move doesn't work, we have something that we actually can work with. Yeah. Um, I've been there and I feel it like it's really good, like setting like with, a, with, a, with the optical uh, side aesthetic first. But uh, nowadays I try it the other way around and it works quite good for me, but it also works the other way around, which is quite cool. That's like a good yeah, but, uh, For me, like aesthetic, I see it maybe differently. Yeah. Like not this obvious, okay, just put the holes yeah. in line or stack them yeah. to fit perfectly together. It can be super random, but looks amazing. Mm. Like it can be mixed brand, mixed shape. And of course, uh, part of aesthetic is how, how it climbs. So it's not just, okay, it's right. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> he is German though. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. Jackie? Um, I think you can go either way. It depends on the day and the, the, if it's a comp or a commercial set, if we have new holds, if we have all the same old holds, if all the holds are clean, like, what wall we're on, what we're trying to do, how much time we have. It's really, I mean, it's one of those things where it, you should be able to come at it from any direction, I think. And I'm sure all of us do, just depending on what you're trying to do that day. So, 
One thing that has kind of just dawned on me is that we're very focused on bouldering, <laughs> which isn't a bad thing. It's a massive part of the industry. Um, but of course, Peter, you have work in Palkirchen, which is basically a lead gym. Um, and I've done a lot of lead setting myself. I know that I've dreamt about moves before I've set them and then got into the gym like, right, okay. I need to find the holds that I can set that move with. Yeah. Uh, taking, taking an arch out here is uh, we've been preparing a um, survey on root setters internationally. Don't know if you were to bring that up. Yeah, I was going to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. perfect. And I, I just filled it out because we're still beta testing it. And um, I ended up putting 90% root setting and 10% boulder setting for myself. So I wouldn't consider myself a boulder setter. Would be the blatant opposite for Nikki. Um, so it's a bit different for when you set roots in relation to boulders. Uh, you'd be on a lift elevated platform or on the rope. There's more technical stuff coming into the actual creation process. And by that, it, it differs a bit. But in the end, you want to create functional movement. That is the bottom line of everything. It has to work. And aesthetics are, to a, to a certain extent, are less important. Because you would have two routes per line, or three routes per line even. And then, then we would have a, a neighboring line to that. So you would end up in being able not being able to play as much with leaving, this, leaving off to the side. You're in a, in a certain area where you have to stick into. Should wait for that. Yeah. And uh, by that, still aesthetics come into play. So I get excited when I get into the whole storage room. And I find that one brand in that one color that, that fits on that line, the holds fit to the gray that, uh, that I'm about to set or that I have to set. So. It's, it's a, a bit of a mix, but there's way more aspects coming into play for setting routes. One of the slides that you showed in your earlier presentation was a photo of the, the gym in Innsbruck, the yeah. giant, as you called it. Um, and I think they do a really good job of managing to set aesthetic commercial routes. And it does basically come down to that. Yeah. You know, the Black Diamond Project was a route that theoretically anyone could try the whole budget for that route alone is probably more than some gyms. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. So I guess that's more of a point than a question, but it, you know, to make a route on a wall that's maybe 20 meters high look really striking mm. is maybe going to cost a lot. Or are there other solutions? It, it's going to cost more, but we're working with uh, gym reps or uh, hold reps to, to have one route per gym be a, the eye catcher route, we call it have special holds, have new holds for that, and to make people, or to attract people to these climbs. Yeah, because even just like one or two really aesthetic lines yeah. are enough to draw people in, and then they yeah. start to understand what they're doing, yeah. especially if those routes are intuitive, like they're all huge holds of one color. It's intuitive, you understand, even if you're not a climber, I wanna grab all those big red holds or whatever. That draws you in, and then you understand what you're doing, and then you can apply that to like the less obvious more like, a, more like a bait the, that you wall. put us, oh, yeah. I want to climb that. I want to go there and climb it. And that's the same in, be it in a boulder, air, boulder context or an elite context. So obviously, it's more, more of an effort in a cost-wise and uh, work-wise in a climbing gym or climbing scenario. Sure. Um, we've got a question on YouTube from King of Pizza Land. Great name. Um, <laughs> and it's actually a really good one in pertinent timing. They ask... Are hold companies, especially the big ones, considering doing subscriptions to holds instead of having to purchase them like so many other industries? So for example, if <laughs> I had a gym, I would subscribe and pay 500 euros per month or whatever, and I would get a box, new box of holds every month, and I would set with those, and then at the end of the month, I assume King of Pizza Land, this is what you're getting at, and then send them back. Yeah, you guys would right. clean and resend them. Yeah, subscription yeah. service. Or rental? Uh, we do rental stuff. Yeah. You do? Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, the concept is just to have a selection of our holds that we want to show. And uh, what we uh, ask from customer is that it's uh, not just used for commercial climbing, but also some, on some events. And then if they decide uh, to keep it, they can keep it, or it moves to another event, and like this. The kill to do something yeah. similar? Uh, we don't currently. It's not a model that's used in the U.S. Uh, we're talking about doing something like that with um, with a, a volume 
friend of ours, they, uh, Stoked Volumes, is going to do a little program like that. We're talking about something like that. I'm not 100% sure if it's, I know it's a model that like Joseph, our rep over here in Germany, has used with clutter culture a little bit. Um, I don't know if it's a model that we'll do in the US or not. It, maybe. Um, I want to know more about kind of how it works. Um, I think people we're, see whole companies as like. We're still in process this. of really yeah. thinking it as. A, Let me as know easy how that's going. I yeah. it. <laughs> Let me know how it goes. I think it's a. I think it's a lot. Like you gotta. I mean, what if a hold gets damaged? Like I mean, they shouldn't. Yeah. But you know. I mean, you could say this about anything on a subscription service, though, right? I mean, yeah. let's use. If we if we talk about your idea, so a rental uh, package. If I you could there's like fashion boxes. You subscribe to a box, the boxes come. You try on the clothes, you like the clothes, you keep them, you don't like the clothes, you send them back. Right. If you damage the clothes, they, they have... You have to buy them. Well, what would you yeah, do Either you have to buy shoes? them. Like, no? would you get a climbing shoe subscription where you just get a pair of shoes for a month and then you send them back and then they send you a new pair? Or they Why send not? That'd be else? amazing. <laughs> no, I mean, but would it? Like, then, I, I don't know. I, I mean, like, how many people out there find the cost of climbing shoes so prohibitive that they stick to the same brand? And if they could try a new brand or a new shoe every month. They have the one pair that they use, right. but then have a new pair, See? and then they go out. A, that's a better idea, probably. Like, they should do I'd that. I'd be we should totally just... down for that. But this is obviously about yeah. holds. But we, I know we have some gym owners and, and managers in the audience. Would anybody see value in the ability to take holds for a month, send them back, and rotate that? You would. Can I come and ask you about it? Yes. Can I, okay, then I want to say something else. No, you go. After. Well, no, I just I think that I think it's like very easy to see like oh this industry is growing a lot and there's like big hold companies or big whatever companies. It's still a really small industry, and I think a big part of that is like we have to like you know climbers will climbers won't buy a t-shirt from a climbing company, but they'll buy like Hurley t-shirts or Volcom t-shirts or whatever t-shirts from like other companies that cost money. They'll buy a five hundred dollar hoodie from a hip hop company in L.A they won't buy a hoodie from La Sportiva or whatever. So the industry doesn't support itself super well, at least in my experience in the United States. Um, it's getting better. But I think that part of that is like, you know, these brands, like I know that like Katya works her butt off, like we work all the time. I'm sure everybody in this industry works all the time. And so we have to support our own industry by buying the products the industry is selling. You know, it's not like there's huge margins. It really isn't, it's not a, a you know, whatever, $200 sweatshirt where we actually only pay $10 from China for it and sell it for 200. Like there's, high cost to a lot of these things because they're specialized, the shoes, the holds. And so part of that making this, you know, making us be able to make new holds is supporting the climbing hold industry by buying holds. And then we can afford more materials to mold more holds. And I'm sure it's the same for other parts of the industry. So I think that there's going to be a balance, but I think it's important to like, we have to support the industry to have the industry provide more things for us. Because 20 years ago, you couldn't set a whole route using the same style of hold because that didn't exist. You know, you picked holds, you did set movement and picked holds 20 years ago because you didn't have that many options for holds, so you just had to find the hold that fit what you. I remember digging through piles of multicolored holds looking for this pocket or whatever. Uh, it's just changing a lot. And so if we like the direction it's going where it's creating these aesthetic lines in these gyms, we have to support that or it's not, we're not going to be able to afford to produce those products to be sold. So 360 comes out with new stuff all the time. But if people are not ever actually buying anything from them, and they're just renting it, but not for very much, their margin goes down. They're not going to be able to make, yeah. I mean, for you sure. know, a ton of new stuff. Maybe. <laughs> well, they, I, we, I guess we that's the question on the model. Somebody has to buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. For sure. Please buy holds. <laughs> in conclusion. But sooner or later, like uh, I know, like in Germany, sometimes volumes get uh, sent around, and sooner or later, the gym keeps it and buys it. Because it's just like, they're just worth it. Like, if you have yeah. good materials, good holds, good volumes, you right. send them to one gym. It, if it is not the first gym, the second gym will take it. Okay. Let's speak to a That's gym owner. Works. Yeah. Right. Oh, oh he's coming that. to me. That's good. Do you want to sit on the end there? Go on, treat yourself. <laughs> you have to go again, though. You're not stopping. <laughs> uh, so we have Jed here from the Climbing Hangar chain of gyms in the United Kingdom. Um, tell me about your perspective on the rental idea. Uh, so a few things, Jack, I'm going to say are not going to be especially popular with you. No, go for it. Right. So I think, interestingly, I think holds have got better. They've made the industry better. And everything about that, that direction of travel is good, except for the fact that cost has gone up and durability has gone down. So there are some PU holds that you will put on a, on a big set, and it will maybe only last three months before you have to put it in the bin. And then the holds are also not recyclable. They're not reusable. And the people that recoat and things, you know, the standard at the moment isn't really there. So if you like the, 
this key piece of infrastructure hasn't kept up with the increase in the demand of the gym. So they're cooler, they're better. And I think that how we sell, what we sell to our customers and we're your customers needs to update and support. So at the moment, I know lots of companies in the United Kingdom at least are using finance products to buy holds and the holds will not last as long as the finance arrangement that they have, which will create a financial problem for that company, which might create an advantage for me is and they'll be able to buy that company in two or three years at a very discounted price. However, <laughs> if you like, when we're talking about supporting the industry, yeah. at the moment, the cost to start a gym has gone up by four, five, six, maybe 10 times, who knows? And the thing that we depend on the most, it's quality in terms of its durability but don't you think it's dropping. That depends on the material. I mean, part of that is purchasing the highest quality material. There's a lot of materials out there. And so part of what makes a hold maybe cost more money is that the base material costs more money. So it costs, it's cost more to the customer because it more was put into creating it, but that gives it the longevity that you don't get with some other like lesser product. But so the rental thing would be really good for you, huh? I think rental, <clears throat> like right now, when you are a gym owner, anybody, who knows financing a business, you don't want assets. Assets are a liability fundamentally because they depreciate over time. Right. What you want is function. You don't want to own the thing. The less things you own, this is why things like Uber and Airbnb are so good because it is a platform that operationalizes other things that other people have, but it minimizes the risk for them. So that's why they're such exciting businesses. So as a climbing wall owner, what I want to do is I want to own as little as possible. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to even out my cash flow. And I don't want to find that, oh my goodness, I've got to replace that hold set. I want to have programmed in a cost for my holds for a year. They are maintained, they're recyclable, they're up to date, and I just pay the same amount every single month. Sure. Yeah. So if you can do that, that'd be lovely. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> how, much, how much do you want to pay a month? Uh, yeah, that's great. One little comment. Yes, like please. Uh, can I stand up? To, yeah. <laughs> go on, go on. Not oh. to trying to excuse any brand or uh, anything, but like it's the um, work in progress, and I'm sure every brand is trying. Uh, I know we are constantly working and developing, and but it's just not like okay, we'll do this tomorrow. So, yeah, that's but so we are really so doing stupid. our best. <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't trying to throw anybody yeah. under the bus and by I'm saying sure that about the quality. Are, I'm just saying, you? yeah, sorry, go. No, I just wanted to say I'm yeah. sure you guys are also the doing. Same. The yeah, same. Yeah, same. Uh, yeah, that's a perfect way to say that. Thank you for <laughs> saying that. Yeah, it's I, everybody's trying to make a better product. And so if a product fails, I hope the company would maybe try to work with you to get you some kind of recompense for having a product that didn't perform to the expectations. Because, well, I mean, they, every, we're, I think everybody's trying their best for sure. It's a small industry. And again, like if they're selling a product and it's failing, you know, they're going to have to fix it or they're not going to continue having a good reputation. So it's important that that the buyer becomes educated about what's available and what those materials are and what process the company's going through. All the companies, I'm pretty sure you could call them and they would talk to you about it. I think everybody's doing their best. So, you know, like we're not a big, it's not like Nike. We're not a big industry. Likewise. Yeah, exactly. So we got to work together because we're all small. Thanks, Jed. Let's give Jed a clap. Just because I like him. And he came up here and spoke unplanned. Um, Ethan has a question for us. We're getting tight on time. Ethan has a question for you all, uh, which is what has been your favorite or most memorable setting experience? We'll start with you, oh, Peter. Geez, that's <laughs> no pressure. Uh, no pressure, but you have to give us an answer now. It's hard to say. Maybe a customer liking your climb the most, that's the most rewarding. And when that happens, um, Taking it to the max would be, oh, that climb was boring because every foothold was there where I expected it or where, <laughs> where I needed one. That would be a, a memorable one. Describing the climb boring by putting it as, as good as I could in terms of feet. It was so good they thought it was boring. Yeah, he said, oh, that was so boring. Whenever I needed a foot, there was one. You're like, so you were comfortable and happy and you didn't like that? I, I liked it because he had a good time, but he didn't know maybe it was boring for him at the, in the m afterwards or describing it, verbalizing about the experience. But Yeah, maybe he was just terrible at verbalizing his yes, experience. Maybe yeah, not, I don't know. not all feedback is necessarily needed. But you to take be. feedback and you yeah. process feedback. And, yeah. uh, you don't have to take it to heart. I, I liked it. I took it as a rewarding for feedback for myself. So. Nice. Caddy, what about you? 
Um, I think it was two things. Um, setting at Adidas Rockstars to exchange with a lot of high-level root setters, just experience that basically. And then also there was this guy, like I set a route maybe six years ago in a gym, and he's still talking about this route. He wants it again. <laughs> and it's like, it's so crazy to me that he still remembers. What was so special funny. about it? I don't know. He just really liked it. <laughs> it's, it you don't remember the route yourself? And he was super sad that it was gone. Awesome. Jackie? Um, I mean, I, I guess... I don't have an answer. Uh, there's an event I do called Women Up in San Francisco. It's all female setters, and it's a teaching event. So we have newer female setters and, and touchstone interns. We do two clinics during the week, and we also set an entire comp, like a Red Point comp and finals. And uh, it's super amazing. They're really supportive of women setting. It's really cool to bring other women into setting. Now there's a lot, but there didn't used to be. Um, it works. We work well with all the male setters and the crew as well, too. It's just like a really nice, inclusive event. And uh, it's really satisfying to have an event like that where we get to teach and kind of bring more people in so they'll be able to have like these cool experiences that we have and also improve, you know, like at least half your climbers now, maybe not half, but closer women. So we need more female setters. So I think for, for men and women, um, just to get more variety of like styles and movement and climbing out there. So that's probably my favorite thing we do. Niklas. Uh, for me, it was two things. The first thing was like setting my first uh, competition on a regional level when I was setting my first pedal dyno. That was like in 2012. And like, uh, like as a competitor or as a setter, you always try to have like this, uh, like like a drama. Like the first competitors don't know what to do. So the first, I think the first four guys didn't touch the hole they were jumping to, and then it got better and better and better. So like a top and a couple of tries, another top, and, and then a flash. So that was really cool for me. Like. Pretty young, uh, I don't know how young I was, but like really exciting. The move was pretty new as well. And the other thing was uh, would have been like the hard moves final, the first one in the swim opera because we were setting like in a in an indoor pool swimming bath like, and we were setting. We didn't know how to, how it worked. We were setting on a construction sites like on a, on a swimming platform on a ponton, and we were working. I think we finished setting at seven in the morning, and the competition started in another gym at eight. So we were going. That was awesome teamwork, and it was like setting, I think like 17 hours straight. That if you haven't seen the Hard Move Super yeah. Final, it still is available on YouTube, and it's absolutely worth watching. That thing is yeah. unique, to say the least. <laughs> what about you, Katya? Mm, yeah, many many moments, <laughs> but yeah, maybe I will remember. Uh, very well the first World Cup that I said, just because it was first and it was something that I never thought I, I'd do and I did. So When was that? Which <laughs> uh, was that one? Last year in Japan. So it was super cool to set with all guys. And yeah, I'm happy that I got this opportunity. <laughs> My personal highlight was setting, it was a commercial set for a gym down south of England. And um, I set a dyno pretty lame to do, but it was, it was a dyno that was, the idea was that most people would be able to do it. It's about V5. And if you've ever seen uh, online, Matt Phillips, who's world champion British paraclimber, mm. Matt did it, one arm, like absolutely nailed it. And I'd set it so that you had to catch, I think he is, doesn't have his left arm, and I'd set it so you had to catch with the left arm. Yeah. So when he caught it with his right arm, I was so, cool. I'll never forget that. And he was like, that was so awesome. It was so <laughs> good, man. Um, any questions, points to raise before we wrap this up because we are getting tight on time? No, okay. Any closing statements that you'd like to make? Anything you'd like to say, folks? Enjoy setting and then the climbers will enjoy climbing. That is a... Oh, wow. yeah. Give, Peter. No, Give Peter a round of applause for that. <laughs> enjoy setting and climbers will enjoy climbing. Love that. Yeah, okay. Um, one last thing that I will say, and I'm going to say it right down the camera, is if you are a root setter and you are watching this, we will be publishing online, I believe tomorrow, a root setting survey. It's going to be available first in English and another language. German and French. German and French. And then it will also consequent. Uh, yeah, next after that, it'll be... Spanish and Japanese. Yeah, perfect. I'm so glad Peter's here. So English, French, German, Spanish, and Japanese. Please, if you are a root setter, fill out that survey. It's going to be the biggest collection of root setting data ever taken. So we'd love you to be involved. Are you guys going to fill it out? Sure. Yeah, why not? Not in Slovenian, unfortunately, but you can do it in English. <laughs> for now. 
Um, yeah, and so you guys as well, please do look for that. We will post an edited link in the description to this video. And we'll also post it in Root Setters Anonymous. If there is nothing else, then I would like to say a huge thank you to Peter, Caddy, Jackie, Nicholas, and Katya. Thank you so much to you guys. Let's give them a round of applause. Give you guys a round of applause. Well done. <laughs> uh, you did great. Thank you so much to you guys for tuning in. And if you're watching this after the fact, thanks for watching it. Uh, my name is Liam Lonsdale. It's been my pleasure to host. And we will see you somewhere sometime soon. Good afternoon. <laughs>